Hey guys, welcome to Woodwork Life. Today, we're restoring a couple of old hand planes that I got off eBay. I picked up both these Stanley Bedrocks on eBay for about 200 bucks. You could probably get a lot better deal at a swap meet or just lucking out at a garage sale, but I never have such luck. The 605 has a broken tote, and that'll need to be addressed. It will also run into its fair share of screws and nails throughout his lifetime. The 604 is actually in really good shape. It's even got a little bit of the Stanley sticker left on the tote. It said on the auction it was factory original red, but clearly it was hastily painted red to mark it as someone's tool on a job site. So we've got a few tasks ahead of us, but let's jump right in. So the first step is obviously going to be to break these down. It's a pretty easy process, but obviously if this is your first hand plane breakdown, make sure you take pictures so you know where everything goes back. I'm showing you how to do it on a Stanley Bedrock, but every plane's different. As you take the planes apart, it's fun to kind of think about what the plane went through and what its story was. What did the previous owner do with this thing? All right, so now that I got everything disassembled, I'm gonna do a quick flat lay to kind of assess the situation. So to me, there's really four parts of restoring a hand plane. You obviously have the sole, flattening, removing rust, cleaning it up, um, saving whatever amount of the japanning that you can. Next, you have your mating surfaces. You wanna flatten your uh, frog and uh, the place where the frog is accepted within the sole to the best of your abilities. Um, that's really important in the accuracy of the plane. Next is going to be your blade and chip breaker. These are really important to find out what you need to restore from the way it was maintained throughout its lifetime. Cap iron is kind of part of that. The other piece is going to be just be general rust removal and generally your smaller steel components will need uh, different levels of addressing. And then of course uh, your brass. Usually I just like to get the brass to a nice polish. It has a nice tarnish to it. I leave it the way it is, but really just restoring that. I guess really it's five steps if you also include the totes. Uh, typically, I try to buy planes where the totes are intact. I, I, I like the original handles. I have made some in the past, but to me it's generally, I don't know, there's enough planes out there. I try to find them where I don't have to do that. All right, now we're gonna work on getting some of the rust off these soles. Um, there's so many good uses for a good set of flat diamond stones. Uh, here, I'm just gonna work on not necessarily flattening, but just removing the rust. This way you don't roll over any of the edges. You can move the stone, move the plane, whatever's easiest. Just gonna keep working it down until we remove that rust. Um, we're not gonna actually flatten it until we put the whole thing back together. But for now, we just check our progress to make sure we don't remove too much material. Now, if you ever do happen to get one of these corrugated planes and want to get the rust out of the uh, corrugations, um, I went to Harbor Freight and I found this little uh, file set. They're probably not the greatest files, but they just so happen to be just the right size to clean out these corrugations. Now, I'm being very careful not to put take off any additional metal from the, uh, the sole of the plane, but this is pretty good for just clearing out some rust. So unfortunately, it looks like a lot of the original Japaning is coming off with the paint. We'll keep working on it though. Now that we got all that red paint and grime off, you can actually see the patent dates. Those two patents cast into the sole generally mean that you have a later model Stanley Bedrock plane. So some people are gonna hate me for this, but the Japaning on this one's just too far gone. There's rust that's starting to actually penetrate the sole. Uh, I mean, you could preserve it, but at that point, you'd also be just exposing it to more rust on the road. I want this thing to last another couple lifetimes. So I'm gonna go through with a Dremel brush and just sort of get some of the rust out of the details. I was really careful to not touch any of the brand marks or patents. Those are important to me. And I, I just really cleared up some of the loose rust. Um, you can see some of the spots where it's actually down to bare metal. So I didn't want that to rust any further. So I went ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and put another coat of paint on this. Before you spray anything, make sure you tape off any of the mating surfaces and expose parts of the plane that are easy to access. 
Now, I like to spray spray lacquer on these because the way I see it, originally Japaning was invented by Europeans to copy the Japanese lacquering technique. And I figured they'd be jealous of my spray lacquer anyway. It's a lot quicker and almost as durable. It won't last a hundred years like a good Japaning will, but it'll last a long time. And if you slowly build up the coats to build up a nice shell, you want to put a nice thick covering that looks pretty nice. Almost original, really. I did a little bit to clean up the frog on the number five, um, but the biggest issue with this is really just that the uh, lateral adjustment mechanism is a little bit stuck. So I'm just gonna spray some WD-40 in there. Let's try to work it loose. So I've already shown you how to sharpen a blade that's been well maintained. Uh, you can find that in the sharpening video. I'll link to that right up here. Um, but what if you don't want to go through all those steps of flattening and you know maintaining the blade, especially on some of this old steel? Uh, and this one wasn't particularly well maintained. Uh, I'm going to show you a quick method to hand sharpen without using the jig to get a functional sharp edge. And this is this is probably more suggested for plain blades than it would be for a chisel. But you could use it for a chisel as well if you just wanted a functional edge. Gonna, we're going to go through our diamond stones from coarse to fine, to extra fine to extra extra fine. But this time we're gonna handhold and try to find a good angle where we can get an edge off of whatever this was maintained, however this was maintained before. What you're gonna do is you're gonna stand over your stone centered with your body. You're gonna put your left foot forward, take your arms and lock your elbows into your body, grab the iron with one hand like this, take the other hand and take two fingers and put it on the blade. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna find an angle that feels comfortable on the stone and you're gonna just move your hips with your elbows still locked in. You're gonna just move your hips and just subtly move your body, just swaying to give you a nice figure eight motion on the stone. So you can see we're actually starting to find a little bit of that edge there. All right, now once you have a burr all the way across that blade, you can move on to the next stone. And it's just rinse and repeat. This is just kind of a biomechanical thing. If you just try to point your knee at the same spot again, it's gonna be a lot easier to repeat that angle. So I'm, I'm onto my fine stone now. And again, lock my arms in like a T-Rex, point my knee just to the left side of my stone, just pointed right at the center of the stone, and just rock my hips. Make sure you flip the iron over to knock off the burr on the back edge, and pay special attention to this front edge here. As long as you get this front edge flat and a little bit of sheen to it, you're gonna be able to get a nice sharp edge on this tool. So we just came off the 8,000 grit stone, and at this point, we're very sharp. Uh, we got a nice flat back bevel there, and then you've got a nice sharp bevel. This is really sharp and it could do plenty of good work, but I like to take it to the power strop just to give it that little bit finer edge. Before taking everything for its final strop, you might want to address the chip breaker. It just needs to mate well with the plain iron. This one does pretty well, but I'm going to touch it up a little bit. As for sharp, it shaves better than my Mach 3. Now, I'm a little anal when it comes to cleaning up all the components in a plane after I take it apart. I first start with a soak in white vinegar. Cooking or cleaning's fine, whatever's cheaper. But I like to clean out every thread and every piece and get as much rust off the components as I can before I put the plane back together. There are certainly harsher and more effective chemicals, but they're also more expensive and I'm cheap. So I usually just soak them in vinegar and then hit all my components with a wire brush to clear off all the rust. Push comes to shove, you may need a little bit of sandpaper, but I can make do with the wire brush. Now, don't mind me while I finish cleaning up all these components before we start putting this thing back together. If we can't salvage this tote, looks like it was a good clean break. And uh, wood glue is going to dry even harder than the wood, so let's see if we can't get a good glue joint on this. It's end gra edge grain to edge grain, so it should hold okay. Just liberally apply glue and see if we can't get it to survive. It's 
So with these handles, there's a couple ways to getting the uh, finish off. Uh, it's typically just a lacquer, and it'll usually just scrape right off with the uh, flat edge of a chisel. It isn't always necessary to remove the finish from the handles, but since I made the repair on the one, I wanted to make it look as seamless as possible. So now that I got the totes all cleaned up, um, we can give them a coat of boiled linseed oil. We just removed all of that rust from all these components, but we don't want them to get rusty again. I'm just not a huge fan of machine oils. I just don't like the way they smell. Uh, jojoba oil does not, well, eventually it will go rancid, but it takes a long time to go rancid. So you just wanna give all of these components a good, healthy smattering of the jojoba oil, and this will prevent them from getting rusty again. All right, so now that we've got these things all greased up, let's uh, get them back together so we can get them flattened. I believe the, this one is for the five. I think the number four was this guy. Yeah, made in. Made in New Britain, Connecticut, USA. Now we'll add the brass that I cleaned the paint off of and polished up. I use reverse thread so I don't try to force them. Now we put the tote in. This guy's got his little screw to tighten it down with. The iron back in. Put the iron back in the right way up. There we go. Put our lever cap back on. Square up our iron. So this one took the tote, of course, with the red paint. And then put the tote in. Nice and secure. And we'll attach it with a little chooched out screw. And there we have a beautiful Stanley Bedrock 604. Now, same thing with the number five. First, we'll get the uh, iron assembled. Wipe off a little bit of the grease. And these irons, I just like to leave just a sliver, um, like a 32nd of an inch. And on this number four, I'll use this buggered up block nut, because that's what it came with. All right, so we got that. You can see I did take a second to buff up the uh, edge of the chip breaker on a old Frankenstop, old Frankenstrop, just to make sure those shavings slide up real easily. Put the frog in. This tote's pretty cool because it just sits on top. It doesn't lock around the metal inside the uh, body like the other one does. Probably a generational thing. And you can tell this one was definitely a user. Um, whoever had this used it a lot. Probably a carpenter. Looks like it hit a bunch of nails and it's got a big story behind it. And it's got the coolest corrosion here. I'll see if I can get a close-up of it on this little screw that holds the tote. You 
And you can wax these screws if they're not moving very well, but the brass on the steel kind of has a natural lubricating property. There we go. There we go. Stanley Bedrock number 4C and the Stanley Bedrock number 5605. So now that the plane looks good, we got to make sure it's nice and flat on the sole so that it performs well. So I'm going to take my coarse diamond stone and I'm going to give it a couple passes and see how flat the bottom of this is. All right, so you can see there, we've got a high spot right beneath the mouth, high spot right above the mouth. We've got a reference face almost to the edge. And we do have a reference face actually all the way to back here. So we're pretty much effectively flat. So whoever was using this, as ugly as they had it presented with the red paint, they took decent care of it. Now we've got the plane relatively flat and we've got it all oiled up and ready to go. You just wanna take a little bit of beeswax or a candle or any kind of wax really. Just give it a little bit of a coating of wax there on the bottom. Just lightly, it'll spread out as you, as you use it on the plane. And that's just to lubricate the wood um, as you go over. It'll make planing a lot easier, you'd be surprised. Now with your first couple cuts, you'll just wanna move the uh, depth adjustment. Just rotate it to the right, to clockwise. And that will take, bring the iron out. And you just wanna keep lightly adjusting it until you just barely take a shaving. There we go, just the wispiest of shavings. Now pay attention to those first couple shavings. And if they're coming heavier on one side of the blade than the other, moving the lever cap, no not the lever cap, moving the adjustment lever to the left will take more cut on the right. Moving the adjustment lever to the right will take more cut on the left. So looks like I'm getting a little bit extra cut on the left there. So I'll just go slightly to the right. I'm sorry, slightly to the left. So that does it. These planes really turned out better than I even could have hoped. Um, I really just love the story about them. Some of my favorite parts, the, uh, the 22 markings on the number five. Um, I just, you know, this was probably in somebody's toolbox and they use it every day. Um, and just all the nicks on the, uh, the knurled knob here. And I don't, I don't know, there's something about this little corroded screw that just really draws me there. I posted some pictures on my Instagram if you wanna check it out. Um, and, and I know that the guy totally, you know, destroyed this thing by painting it red, and I probably destroyed it even further by painting it black, but either way, it's a great user now. Um, and nobody'd be the wiser unless they were a collector or something like that. But it's, I mean, it, this is something that's just gonna be, you know, in my everyday toolkit, so no big deal. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you did enjoy this, uh, consider subscribing to my channel. And, and I hate to do this because I don't think I've really earned it yet, but I do have a Patreon page, but I feel really bad asking you guys to join it, but it's down there in the links below if you want to check it out. Uh, but if you do want to help support this channel right now, just if you're going to buy something off Amazon, just please use my link. It might help me out just a little bit. So thanks for watching today with Woodwork Life. And remember to keep your tools sharp and keep your mind even sharper.